I have learned to do two things in my public life, and one is to have a short memory and the other is to have a thick skin. There had to be pressure being the first woman on oh. the United States Supreme Court. The pressure came largely from the enormous amount of media and public attention. Mm -hmm. I couldn't move without a battery of television cameras following my every step, and that was a level of attention that nobody wants to experience. It was very intense. If anyone was prepared for that level of scrutiny, it was Sandra Day O'Connor. At age 16, she was admitted to Stanford, where she graduated from law school in 1952. Then, by sheer determination, she got a job as a lawyer when many law firms simply were not hiring women. In 1969, she was appointed to the Arizona Senate, where she later became the first woman in any state legislature to serve as a majority leader. All of those things in her background certainly contributed to her ability to do the job as a Supreme Court Justice. And all of them, I'm sure, relate back to the way she was raised and the way she grew up. Sandra Day grew up in southeastern Arizona on the Lazy Bee Ranch with her mother, Ada May, and her father, Harry. She loved to go out and round up and, you know, be a part of the crew and, you know, be a part of ranching. When Sandra was six, her parents sent her to school in El Paso, Texas, where she could live with her grandmother and be around other kids. She returned to the ranch summers and holidays, and by the time she was nine, Sandra had two siblings, Anne and Alan. She was always just the, the big sister that could do everything. The day's house was in Arizona, but the rest of the ranch, about 250 square miles, straddled the Arizona-New Mexico border. It was the kind of thing where you could walk outdoors and you could look any direction and everything you could see is ranch, our ranch. Those wide open spaces provided plenty of room to work hard, have fun, and dream big. For Sandra, one of those dreams was going to Stanford, where in 1952 she graduated from law school near the top of her class. I could not get a single interview with a law firm in California, because I was female. And they had all these notices on the placement board at Stanford Law School. Come call us, we want to talk to you. But they didn't want to talk to me. You know, nobody was hiring women. And that continued, really, for about another 20 years, that women were not hired by large law firms. After a friend pulled some strings, Sandra finally got her interview. And he said, well, if you could type well enough, I might be able to get you on here as a legal secretary. But Miss Day, we've never hired a woman lawyer, and I don't see the day when we will. Sandra turned to the public sector, but the San Mateo County attorney told her he didn't have a budget to hire her. And I said, now I know you don't have any money, but I could work there for nothing for a time until you can persuade the supervisors to give you a little money. And I know you don't have any space, but I met your secretary and she's wonderful. And if she'd let me have a desk in her office, I'd be glad to sit there. And he went for it. <laughs> And that's how I got in the door. Instead of being stymied by obstacles, she found a way either to go around them or sometimes just go through them. That might have been a trait she got from her dad. Sandra learned from him that, you know, you think things through, you make a plan, and then you kick it in the ass. Failure wasn't one of the options. In December of 1952, Sandra Day married John O'Connor, who she began dating in law school. In 1953, the Army sent John to Germany. Sandra followed working as a civilian attorney in Frankfurt. The O'Connors moved to Phoenix in 1957, where Sandra opened a law office. Then the couple started a family. They had three sons, Scott, Brian, and Jay. In 1965, Sandra became an assistant Arizona attorney general. In 74, after serving as a state senator, she was elected as a superior court judge in Maricopa County. Five years later, Governor Bruce Babbitt appointed O'Connor to the Arizona Court of Appeals, setting the stage for an extraordinary meeting on July 1st, 1981 in the Oval Office. 
President Reagan and I had a conversation that lasted perhaps 35 minutes or so. He was pretty interested in my ranch background and uh, fixing fences and riding horses and a few things like that. But he did ask questions of, of substance as well. And I don't think it was a week later when the president called me and I was at my chambers at the Court of Appeals. Sandra, I'd like to announce your nomination to the court tomorrow. And I was thunderstruck, really, and very concerned because it's a very hard job. And I didn't think that my experience on Arizona's courts had prepared me for that. John was more enthusiastic about it than I was. He said, of course you have to do it. He had no doubt, of course, he had that no you doubt. could do it. He had no doubt. I had many doubts. I will send to the Senate the nomination of Judge Sandra Day O'Connor of Arizona. Court of Appeal. I was driving to work. When I turned on the radio, President Reagan was in the middle of his comments. And so, you know, I was saying, who is it? Who is it? And then finally, one of the announcers came on afterwards, one of the commentators, and said he's just announced he, that he's nominating Judge Sandra Day O'Connor from Arizona. And quite unexpected, I just burst into tears. All of a sudden, you know, all doors were open. All things were possible. It was just an extremely emotional time for many women. The confirmation hearings of Sandra O'Connor, the first woman named to the Supreme Court. The Senate Judiciary Committee held three days of hearings starting September 9th. I think it's very important that each branch of government carry out its function in preserving and complying and living within the dictates of the Constitution. The Senate voted unanimously to confirm Sandra Day O'Connor. Four days later, on September 25th, 1981, she was sworn into office. Really, since 1981, I would say, is when our real friendship started, and it's continued until the present. Ruth McGregor served as a law clerk for Justice O'Connor her very first year on the court. She was very much my role model as a judge. And when I became a judge, first on the Arizona Court of Appeals and later on the Arizona Supreme Court, I mean, I ran my chambers pretty much the way that she did hers. She gave me a really good template for how to handle being an appellate judge and how to stay objective and neutral and keep your personal feelings out of making decisions. Were there decisions that you kind of look back and go, hmm, Maybe I should have done X and Y instead of Z. Actually, I don't do that. And I'll tell you that I decided very early on that it wasn't a good idea to look back, that I ought to try to do the best I could and then don't look back. Make a decision and go on. She was often in the majority on 5-4 decisions. She learned in the legislature how to bring people together. My husband, John, and I built an adobe, sun-dried adobe house. As a state senator, she used that house yes, to entertain yes, colleagues. Both Democrats and Republicans make some Mexican food, serve some beer, and make friends. If you know people well, it's going to be harder to be nasty and disagreeable. You might reach a compromise on a few things. From my observation, the biggest change for her over the years was that she gradually became aware of how much difference she could make. I think that's why after retirement, you know, she focused her efforts on the rule of law, judicial independence, and civic education. She founded iCivics in 2009. It's a curriculum of online games that teaches kids about their government. And every young person needs to learn about it if they're gonna be involved, if they're gonna be effective as citizens. iCivics became, you know, so important to her. I know she said she regards it as the most important thing that she did. In her lifetime of public service, Sandra Day O'Connor made history, and she made a difference by showing us what is possible, what is just, and what is good. It's been quite the ride for this Arizona ranch girl who became an American icon. Because she's Sandra, it's real simple. It's Sandra, and Sandra can do anything. It took 191 years to get one woman on that court. That's a long time.